Hello and welcome to Rugby and District Astronomical Society's Sky Notes for the period from the 16th of June to the 21st of July 2013. We'll start off as usual with our naked eye view of the sky and this is where the stars will appear at midnight on the 1st of July, 2300 on the 15th of July and 2200 on the 30th of July. During July the sky never gets really dark enough to see fainter stars or objects but the summer constellations will be overhead and the summer triangle of Deneb, Vega and Altair are at high elevation in the south. Capella is bright and just above the horizon in the north. We have Leo and Virgo setting in the west and finally Pegasus and Andromeda are rising in the east. In the summer the Milky Way is clearly visible overhead if you're in a dark sky area when the moon's below the horizon or is a crescent and it makes a nice photographic image if you use a camera on a tripod with a wide angle lens, an exposure time of around 30 seconds and an ISO setting of usually between 400 and 800. We'll look at some naked eye and photographic subjects for this month photographic meaning a camera on a tripod rather than using a telescope. Just before sunrise on July the 6th there's a nice grouping of the moon which will be a very thin crescent only 4% illuminated, Mars at magnitude 1.5 and Jupiter at magnitude minus 1.9. Jupiter will actually rise at 0350 so it will be up a little bit before the sun and you should just about be able to capture this. A word of warning though, if you're going to try to use a telescope or binoculars to look for Jupiter, bear in mind it will be very close to the Sun and uh, make sure you're not looking in that direction with an optical instrument as the Sun rises. At the other end of the day, at the 10th of July at sunset, Venus will be above a very thin crescent moon which will be 6% illuminated at 21.25 when it's sunset. The Moon will set at 21.59 and Venus at 22.47, which is before the end of an nautical twilight. In the evening of the 17th of July at 2200, Saturn will be around about 3 degrees away from the Moon, just to the west of due south. The Moon will be gibbous and about 70% illuminated. And finally, the Delta Aquarid meteor shower will be reaching its peak this month. It, it's active from around July the 12th to the 23rd of August and its main peak is predicted to be on the 28th at around about 8 o'clock although this is in the early evening and the sun will still be up. The radiance can be found using the great square of Pegasus looking towards the south although when you're looking for meteors it's best to look around about 45 degrees away from the radiant and 45 degrees above the horizon which is where you'll actually see the longest duration trails of the meteors. Of course in August on the 12th we have the peak of the Persid meteor shower so some of the meteors you see if you're going to look for that shower will actually be Delta Aquarids. This month we're going to be looking at Hercules and some of the objects that you can find there. Hercules being the legendary hero who had 12 tasks to perform and he's shown in modern constellation art as wrestling with the many-headed snake the Hydra while kneeling on the back of Draco the Dragon. His second task was to kill the Hydra which could regrow any heads he chopped off and the reason he's kneeling on the back of Draco is that his 12th task was to obtain the golden apples of the Hesperides, so which he had to kill the dragon to do so. If you're unfamiliar with what Hercules looks like in the night sky, find the bright stars Vega and Arcturus, draw an imaginary line between them and about a third of the way along the line you'll come to the asterism known as the Keystone and this is the body of Hercules. And from there you'll be able to begin to pick out the rest of the stars in the constellation. Using smaller astronomical instruments, some of the stars are worth having a look at. Alpha, which is also known by the Arab name as Ras al Gethi, which means the kneeler's head, is a binary star resolvable in most small telescopes. 
the primary is an irregular variable star which is a red giant it has a diameter of around about 400 times that of the sun and lies 400 light years from earth its minimum magnitude is 4 and maximum of 3 the secondary which orbits it every 3600 years is a bluey green coloured star with a magnitude 5.4 beta also known as Corneferos is the brightest star in Hercules it's a yellow giant, magnitude 2.8, and lies about 148 light years from Earth. Delta is a double star rather than a binary star, which is divisible in small scopes. The primary is a blue white star of magnitude 3.1, lying 78 light years away from the Earth, and its optical companion is of magnitude 8.2. Gamma is also a double star, which is divisible in smaller instruments as well. The primary is a white giant of magnitude 3.8, 195 light years from Earth, and its optical companion is widely spaced and is a tenth magnitude star. Zeta is a binary star, and the smaller component has an orbital period of 34.5 years. The stars are beginning to separate now, and in medium aperture telescopes, such as a 6 to 8 inch instrument, you will be able to split the two, but they won't be splittable in smaller instruments at the moment. The components widen to their maximum separation in 2025. The system lies 35 light years from Earth, and the primary is a yellow star, magnitude 2.9, and the secondary is an orange coloured star, magnitude 5.7. Hercules is also home to two prominent globular clusters. M13, which we looked at last month, is the most famous one, and is almost visible to the naked eye under a dark sky and clearly visible in anything from binoculars upwards. M92 is nearly as bright with a visual magnitude of 6.3 and lies about 26,700 light years away. It's also one of the oldest clusters in the Milky Way. It was actually discovered first by Bode in 1777 and Charles Messier rediscovered it himself on the 18th of March 1781 and added it to his catalogue as M92. There's also a ninth magnitude planetary nebula, NGC 6210, which lies 4,000 light years from Earth, which is visible in scopes larger than about 3 inches. And object Abel 2151, the Hercules cluster of galaxies, is also found in the area. Last month we looked at the inferior planets. Those are the ones that lie between the Earth and the Sun, and we looked at their conjunctions and greatest elongation. This month we're going to move outside of the Earth's orbit to look at the superior planets. Superior planets can also be in conjunction when they're on the, the opposite side of the Sun to where the Earth is, and they will lie either directly behind or very close to the Sun, making observation impractical for amateur astronomers at this time. When they're the opposite side of the Sun to the Earth, they're known as being in opposition. They're also the, they're closest to the Earth at this point, and their angular size, which is the apparent size of the planet, is at its largest. The planets, of course, the planets, of course, don't actually vary in size, but as the relative distance between the Earth and the planet changes, they can appear to be larger or smaller in the night sky. The last position we'll look at is known as quadrature. This can be east or west, depending on where the planet lies in relation to the Earth. And it's when a line drawn between the Earth and the planet and the Earth and the Sun at um, an angle of 90 degrees. The reason we'd look at planets at this time is because they will exhibit phasing. Phases, of course, might be most obvious when we look at the Moon during the course of a month. And the phasing on the planets is more subtle. The only one that shows any real phasing is Mars. Uranus and Neptune, you wouldn't see any phasing at all, really, because they lie so far away from the Earth. The best way to appreciate the angle of the Sun and the Earth in relation to a planet is to look at Saturn's rings. At certain times of the year you'll see the shadow cast by the planet lying across the rings and close to the limb of the planet you'll see a little black area on the rings where they don't get any sunlight to reflect back to us. We'll move on now to this month's images. This one of the Sun was taken by Chris Longthorne on the 26th of May at 16.51 hours using a 4 inch scope and a 2 cam webcam at 15 frames a second for 2 minutes. He stacked the resulting image and you can clearly see the sunspots on the disc. 
Next up we have Tina Jackson's image of Saturn taken on the 26th of May at one of our observing events. This was taken with a Nexstar 4SE 4 inch MacCast scope using the Next Image webcam and you can clearly see the Cassini division and the cloud banding on the planet. Sarah Meek took this one on the same evening using a 6 inch telescope and the same Next Image webcam. The image is a little bit brighter and a little bit more detail can be seen on the planet and the rings. And we'll be looking at an image taken with the same webcam but through a larger telescope in a minute. Here we have some of mine. This was taken on the 26th of May, the same as the last two Saturn images you've just seen. And the reason we were observing this thing on the 26th of May was to capture this triangle of planets, Jupiter, Venus and Mercury just after sunset. Towards the end of May, there were some images taken with a next star 4SE and a next image. Again, using a small telescope on the moon does give you a wider angle view than using a really large instrument. There's a fairly narrow field of view and is better suited to deep sky objects or planets. So you can see here the area from Plato to Babbage featuring the Sinus Iridium and also the landing site of Luna 17, one of the Russian space probes. Moving further down the Terminator, we have the craters of Hermann and Grimaldi. And here we have an image of Saturn taken with a 9 inch telescope, again using the next image webcam. The cloud banding can be seen more easily, as can the Cassini division, but you will pick up these through a 4 inch scope as well. The dot to the left is Titan, and this is a composite of two images one to capture the detail of the planet, and one overexposing the planet to capture the moon. And here, of course, we have M57, the Ring Nebula in Lyra. It's one of 20 images that was taken during the run on a digital SLR camera and a 9.25 inch scope. And this one was discarded from the actual stack because of the satellite trail running across the middle of it here. But it's still quite a nice image. Looking round towards the north in Ursa Major and using a focal reducer on the 9.25 inch scope, it's possible to get both M97, the Owl Nebula, to the right of the image and and M108, the edge on galaxy, towards the upper left of the image. And finally we have M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. This is a stack of 20 individual exposures and the light levels were slightly adjusted in GIMP to produce the final image of not only the dumbbell shape but the actual circular structure around the centre of the dumbbell itself and some of the lobing as well. So it just remains to thank Chris Longthorne for his preparation of Sky Notes this month and the contributors of the individual images that we've used.